so thank you again for that great introduction and um, thank you all for having me and being here to listen to this presentation so my presentation will be about shipwrecks of sri lanka however i really did not want to do a very technical and a matter of fact presentation about shipwrecks what i am going to do instead is to take you on a very interesting story right and then at the end of this uh, presentation you will understand what this tagline means means to history so uh, as a explorer one of the biggest challenges i have and uh, graham talked about me uh, you know trying and finding shipwrecks is that yes there are millions of shipwrecks uh, all around the world but the ocean is absolutely a huge place right so there's no chance for me to just randomly dive around and uh, hoping to stumble on a shipwreck so for this purpose i actually as uh, graham mentioned i rely on a network of fishermen uh, in sri lanka who you know there are the people who are day in day out in the ocean and their lines get entangled in shipwrecks their nets get entangled so they know that there is something uh, down there and they tell me okay there's something uh, down there maybe you should you know you should go and just take it out so that's how i uh, stumble on most of my shipwrecks so this story starts uh, with actually this fisherman called vasanta kumar who lives in kalpuda in the eastern seaboard of sri lanka Uh, in early 2014 he was fishing off bandaloos bay i think you know uh, you know where the paskuda hotels are right in front of it about 9 kilometers in the ocean he was fishing and he pulled uh, he was pulling his net when he found this very strange piece of metal in his net so now him being a curious person he didn't just throw it out thinking that it's it's junk junk fortunately he kept it and he called another fisherman who was a friend of his and told him that listen i think i found this very interesting piece of uh, you know metal from the ocean it looks like aluminum it could be part of an aircraft so the friend of uh, the, the person was on the talk to is also a fisherman and well well known to me he immediately called me and uh, talked to me about prasanth's discovery so i was really excited right now how, how many times can you Uh, you know if it's if it's really a plane how many times can you really find a plane underwater we don't really have many planes uh, underwater in sri lanka so i just jumped uh, at this opportunity and i somehow managed to uh, convince vasant to take me there so uh, vasant actually operates off the ancient kalpuda jetty i'm sure you have been to this area you can see the old jetty which in fact was a port for shipwrecks uh, sorry for ships uh, for about 100 150 years ago and uh, when i met vasant i uh, took a boat from him he gave me a boatman i took all my tanks and then journeyed about 9 kilometers uh, let me see that i can just uh, okay now i'm sure you see the whole screen uh, so it, it from the kalpuda bay it was about 9 kilometers northeast right in into vandalus bay and we have came to the area that was approximately the location where uh, vasant said he had found this uh, piece of metal Now, so now the thing with looking for shipwrecks in the ocean is that I can't just go and dive and look around the ocean uh, while I'm diving. I need to find a precise location. Otherwise, I don't. I run out of air. Right? It's, it's almost impossible. So I have to be very efficient in in finding shipwrecks. And uh, what I do is I actually use this device called a fish finder or a sonar, which enables me to see under underwater. So you can see the uh, in this example. This is just example. you can see the sea bed underwater so you can see fish you can see the maximum depth so for about one hour i was going around in the boat and trying to see what was under underneath in the in the ocean unfortunately i couldn't see anything it was just flat sea bed so i was like really disappointed i thought okay vasanta must have just you know uh, picked up a piece of junk and there was nothing here so i just was like really devastated because i was so excited in finding something and um, i just sat back in the boat and the boat was now drifting in the current so then i just happened to look at the sonar and suddenly noticed that there was something there in the uh, sonar this time there was i could see there was some some subterranean object but i still can't say whether it's a reef or whether it's something else a shipwreck or even a plane so only one thing to do is to go and dive and find out so the depth here turned out to be 42 meters uh, now i'm going to just uh, Segue a little bit into diving because I am sure uh, there are lots of you who also want to get into diving. So let me just go through uh, some of the few diving basics. So if, uh, now to explore 42 meters and spend reasonable amount of time there, I needed to use what's called technical diving techniques and technical diving uh, gear. 
right? So uh, let me explain the difference between a technical diver and a recreational diver. So if you if you want to start diving uh, as a as a diver, you actually start off as a recreational diver. So for example, if you do the first course, which is about four to five days, you can uh, dive to 18 meters, right? And if you do the advanced open water course, to 30 meters. And then typically people do the rescue diver, which is a great course. To have the skills for people to be able to not only look after themselves but rescue a fellow diver if, if the diver is in trouble, right? And to go further down, you have to do a course called deep speciality and maybe a few other courses. So this is the range of recreational diving. So the thing with diving is the deeper you go, the less time you can stay with a single tank. So your time is very limited. So for me to go to 42 meters, I had to use uh, technical diving skills and gear and uh, techniques. So technical diving involves, uh, again, completely different training courses, different gear, and also uh, I sometimes use different gases like uh, nitrox and helium, but I'm not going to get into the technical details. So these are some of the configurations I use. I explore the depth. So to go to up to about 50 meters, I use what's called side mount with about three tanks, then 52, 70, about four to five tanks back mounted. And if I'm going even deeper, I use a closed circuit rebreather, which essentially recycles my air and I'm more efficient in my gases. So one thing I must say is that uh, the reason that I've been able to do some of these discoveries is the fact that I have been technical, uh, trained in technical diving and also I have been, that enabled me to access deeper nets, which no one has been able to access before and to ex explore with reasonable efficiency. So just an example of a technical dive, why technical dive is complicated. This is a cave dive I did to 84 meters. And you can see, if you look at the time graph, it has taken me about 17 minutes to uh, come to 84 meters. I spent about 12 minutes, but getting back has cost me and, uh, sorry, almost one and a half hours. And the reason is when you explore this deep, the gases you breathe gets infused into your body like nitrogen, helium. And if you just suddenly come up, at best, you will suffer paralysis and at worst, you will, you will die, right? So you have to come up very slowly, spending hours as you get shallower and shallower and decompress. So that's why technical diving is actually very uh, risky. So you have to be more trained and more effective in your uh, knowledge and skills. So uh, back to the plane, sorry, back, back to the alleged plane, which was on the farm. So I was excited, okay, there's something down there. I geared up myself with three tanks and went down to 42 meters. And what did I see? My first glimpse was actually the wing of an aircraft. And this is, uh, this is literally what I saw, the wing of an aircraft full of fish with a couple of groupers swimming around, big groupers. Uh, it was really beautiful. And actually this is also an example why shipwrecks are important or any wreck on the sea is you can see you can see the marine life right it's just exploding with marine life so i just swam around uh, it was a vast field of debris however i managed to find one propeller lying in the seabed right so definitely this was an aircraft and a wheel a beautifully preserved wheel again lying on the seabed at 42 meters and parts of an engine right so i jumped to the conclusion which is something that as an investigator you shouldn't do is that this is a single engine aircraft and Okay, wait, I just uh, maybe before saying that. Uh, so, so this uh, dive site was actually full of groupers. And I think uh, in, in the introduction, I saw you had put a uh, uh, thing about spear fishing. So, generally, most of the dive sites we go to, it's actually devoid of groupers because uh, spear fishermen in scuba diving have uh, dived and actually wiped off all the big species. So, they cause localized extinction. Fortunate for this place, since no one had died, these groupers were not at all afraid of me. In fact, they were so curious, they were actually following me because they had probably hadn't seen a human being before. And they were checking out everything I was doing. So it was quite funny. I looked I look back, I had about two or three groupers in formation behind me. And these were the guys who were there, big guys. So I was actually quite happy to represent uh, humankind in this species. Okay, so uh, what was the single engine plane, right? So it's a mystery. Now I've dived, I found a plane. Okay, what is this? So uh, the, one of the immediate thoughts that came to me was that, uh, was this uh, what I call the British sergeant theory. So British sergeant is not the chap on the right that uh, you, you can see a picture of a person. British sergeant is actually this a ship that was sunk during World War II by the Japanese. 
and uh, when the Japanese bombed this uh, ship, the rear gunner, right, his name was Eric Pointer, that's the picture of him on the top right, he managed to actually put down two single engine Japanese planes. So I was very, very sure that this could be one of those planes because the British sergeant is quite close to, relatively close to where I had found the plane. So now why were the Japanese attacking uh, Sri Lanka during that time? And it was World War II. The reason was they wanted to actually destroy the British Eastern Fleet. And uh, if you remember, this was actually about four, four months later after Pearl Harbor was attacked. And this uh, Admiral you see on the right side, the Japanese Admiral Nagumo, uh, he was the person responsible for the Pearl Harbor attack. So man to man, uh, vessel to vessel, the same uh, fleet of ships came to Sri Lanka to attack Sri Lanka in 1942, April. And his main ad adversary was Admiral Somerville, who represented the British Admiralty. And the war was going on between these two parties. Right? So that was the reason to attack. So now the British knew that the Japanese were encroaching towards Sri Lanka. And in uh, 4th of April 1942, this uh, gentleman called uh, uh, Leonard Bershaw, he's hailed as the savior of Ceylon because him and his crew in a Catalina actually spotted the fleet of Japanese ships far south of Sri Lanka. However, uh, he was shot down. But before he was shot down, he managed to relay a message to, uh, to, uh, back to Kalamba saying, okay, the fleet is here. We are uh, expect an imminent attack, right? Despite all this, the next day, sorry, uh, next day we had a wave and wave of Japanese planes flying over Sri Lanka and bombing. So these were the type of single engine aircrafts that actually came and attacked Sri Lanka. I think you must be familiar with the Zero, right? It's quite a famous craft. So these Japanese planes were quite far superior to the British planes and they managed to actually do quite a lot of damage. So this is the first attack on the 4th, uh, 5th of April 1942. Uh, you can see Kalamba, Golfes. They attacked, uh, sank a couple of ships and in fact allegedly also uh, maybe accidentally bombed the, the Muleria Psychiatric Hospital as well. I'm sure it was an accident. I don't think they meant to do it but there was a huge amount of panic as a result. And the second attack, few days later, on the 9th of April, was the Trinco. So this is actually a photo of uh, Trinco being attacked, the oil, oil tanks. And even in this case, there was an early detection that the attack was going to uh, take place, again, by a Catalina crew, led by uh, Tommy Thomas. But that Catalina also went missing, right? And the attack happened, they, the Japanese attacked uh, the Trinco harbor. And along the east coast, the British Eastern Fleet was, uh, so the, the British fleet had actually spaced themselves out because they were expecting the attack. And uh, you can see the British sergeant on the top, the Hermes, and there was another ship called the HMS Vampire by Australia. And down in Kalmune, there were two ships, the Hollyhock and the Athelstane. So all these were bombed and all these were sunk. More than 300 people died that day uh, within the space of a few hours. And you can see over here, the mystery plane, which I found, is actually quite close to the British side. So that's why I thought this must be one of the planes that was shot down at the British side. So just to give you an idea about the World War II wrecks very quickly, uh, I think we have a Sri Lanka as one of the most iconic shipwrecks in the world. It is the world's first purpose-designed aircraft carrier, the HMS Hermes. And this is actually a photo taken by a Japanese pilot after it started sinking. So the Hermes lies about uh, eight, uh, I think, I believe eight kilometers off the particular lighthouse. It's a, it's amazing wreck, right? So these are some pictures I took some time ago. These are the anti-aircraft guns of the Hermes. The Hermes is about 43 to 53 meters deep. Unfortunately, the Hermes, which is the aircraft carrier, with its deck on top, and when it sank, it actually flipped. So it's the deck is on the seabed and the keel is up and the propellers up. Still, it's a great trick because the marine life is amazing. You can see the fish and you know, there's so much to see. And it's covered with this, what's called black coral, full of uh, beautiful coral trees. You can see lots of ammunition lying around. Uh, not a good idea to go and mess with them. I'm sure, you know, it's still, I'm sure some of them work. So need to keep a healthy distance from these uh, ones. And also I think the key thing about Hermes is, is it really highlights the value of shipwreck for the tourism industry in Sri Lanka. So now this uh, Hermes attracts hundreds of technical divers, experienced technical divers from all over the world, before COVID of course. 
and they just come to the airport they go straight to medic row they spend two weeks one to two weeks just dying in this wreck every day and it brings thousands and thousands of dollars to sri lanka right the transport the hotels the diving everything so you you can actually see a, a foreign diver actually is my late instructor i i took him to dive this ship and um, diving one of uh, diving in the hermes near one of the guns so good example of the economic value of shipwrecks uh, to the country a big mystery so just by the hermes there was this australian uh, hms vampire her majesty's australian service the vampire is a destroyer the vampire is missing so no one knows where it is uh, i will come back to that later and I'll show you where the vampire could be but even the australian navy was here a couple of years ago and actually i met them uh, gave them some pointers as to where to look they were they wanted to do a deep sauna find so this is a ship that is a still is uh, one of the biggest mysteries and i would like to actually one day see if this can be found and uh, we could at least dive but I, i think it's too deep to dive anyway let me get back to it so back to the british sergeant if you start diving today in 4 days after you complete the course you can access this very beautiful ship so this ship you can see that uh, why shipwrecks are important for a second reason marine life right you can see fish are actually sheltering in the shipwreck so this is during daytime a huge shoal of snappers sheltering the rear stern of the of the shipwreck so as i said there were two more shipwrecks in uh, the south which were sunk by the ships sunk by the japanese the hollyhock again excellent marine life foreign divers diving atelstein and one of the unique uh, features of the atelstein is you can still see the rear mounted uh, stern facing gun which was using used as a def defensive gun right so it's still there uh, in the british sergeant there was a gun but app apparently some fishermen had tried to lift it failed and the uh, it had just fallen back to the ocean and forever it has been lost this is still there so as i said uh, if east coast is known for world war east coast is actually known for world war 2 wrecks right so the sri lanka's world war 2 heritage is in the east coast just a note about the vampire it's thought that the vampire actually fell into this deep trench hundreds of meters deep so it's beyond diving range and even beyond sonar range and this you have a really powerful sonar so maybe one day someone will find this i will look for for that day so if the east coast is known for world war 2 wrecks the west coast is known for world war 1 wrecks this is actually map from my book uh, ghost of the deep it shows about maybe 50 wrecks but around sri lanka there are hundreds of more wrecks and these the, the ones that are highlighted here are in diveable range right now if you if when i say diveable range that's up to about maybe 100 meters beyond 100 it gets really difficult logistically and technically so it, it's very hard to dive unless you have a submarine So the Booster Shy and the Perseus, which was sunk in 1917 during World War One, is actually lying um, uh, in front of uh, about 15 kilometers in front of uh, Mount Rainier and Modera. Right. So these are two flagship uh, shipwrecks for Sri Lanka, and I have highlighted them with stars. This uh, identification actually happened as a project which I carried out from 2011 to 2019. I did a lot of work trying to identify this wrecks which fishermen had told me are there but no one knew what they were the best kept secret you can actually see it colombo is one of the best places in sri lanka to dive so if you are in colombo you have no excuse because you just go out and you see it's it's like a huge playground of reefs ships you can spend your whole lifetime diving here not to say that there are really great dives all around sri lanka there are but no one no one thinks of colombo when you think of diving right so it's it's quite amazing that right in our backyard we have so much opportunities so just a story about those two shipwrecks world war 1 this is another interesting story uh, during world war 1 there was a german commerce trader called the sms wolf that was a top secret military mission for 15 months it was traveling all around the world trying to disrupt british shipping and as part of its journey it passed through sri lanka mount rainier modera and laid a string of sea mines the booster shy struck sea mines on the 17th of uh, 1917 17th of february and this is the first picture i took of the booster shy after its sank so booster shy is one of the deepest shipwrecks in sri lanka at about 50 to 58 meters 
And uh, then the next day, a couple of days later, the Perseus was signed. It's actually one of the most beautiful shipwrecks in, in Sri Lanka. I spent hours here because the visibility is always really great. It's like blue water, white sand, lots of fish. And actually, I, sometimes I have dreams about diving this when I'm, when I'm sleeping. So I'm so obsessed with this ship because it's such a beautiful place. You have to dive it to realize it's, it's, it's amazing. So uh, how I identified the shipwrecks, I think uh, you might have heard about this. I found the bells and uh, the bell of the Busucha, I found in 2014, right? And I handed it to the Maritime Archaeological Union and the bell of the Perseus I found in 2019. So you can see the difference. So even the bell of the Worcestershire, when I found it, it looked like the one on the right with all sorts of you know, sedimentation and encrustation. And the maritime archaeologists at the MAU, they cleaned it up. And now it's like this beautiful bell. So the bell of a ship is really important because it gives you the name and the home. So it tells you where it came from and it's, it's a, the ultimate proof of its identity. Just a word about the Maritime Archaeology Unit. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, there's like a, few, uh, a bunch of, a team of scientists, right, archaeologists who are doing some great work. And I'm actually quite privileged to be able to collaborate them and uh, help them out. And they also help me out with information. So this is Rasika, Chandraratna, Amarka, uh, Indika and the team. So they are doing some amazing work identifying shipwrecks, uh, Hindus in the Northeast, and also the Godavai shipwreck, right? So as you know, the Godavai, you may have heard about it. It's one of the oldest shipwrecks in uh, Sri Lanka, in, in Southeast, uh, South Asia, over, over 2000 years old, right? So this uh, is actually a pot shard at the, at, the, at the wreck. And I was fortunate enough to dive with the Sri Lanka sub Club and Rasika and a few others, Amal. So uh, it's, a, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing find. So they are doing a lot of work trying to unearth more secrets of this extremely important wreck for Sri Lanka. All right, so I just uh, went around uh, on, on a tangent, so I'm going to come back to the, the main story. The mystery plane. So at this point, this was an air crash investigation. So I was really excited. Okay, the first time of my life, I'm doing an air crash investigation. Now, uh, if you look at the NGO aircraft investigation series, the NTSB and all the, the, the uh, agencies, what they try to determine is why did the aircraft uh, crash, right? Because they know what the aircraft is. The aircraft crash, they know what it is. So they try to determine why. In this case, the first thing I have to actually determine is what is this Mr. Aircraft? Because I have no idea, right? So, and this meant that I needed to do more dives. I wasn't complaining. I was quite happy to do it. So subsequently for the next few weeks, I was diving it uh, a lot, trying to figure out more clues. Then I stumbled on this, one more propeller a close-up of that, which immediately meant my earlier theory that this was a single-engine aircraft was just blown out. So this couldn't have been a single-engine aircraft. So after this point, I knew now I have to look for a twin-engine aircraft. So I had, I had weeks of frustration studying the aviation disasters in Sri Lanka, the civil losses, known World War II versus I was going through plane pictures, trying to compare features, contacting aircraft experts. So it was, it was like really frustrating and I was like, really disappointed because I thought, okay, I wouldn't be able to make any progress. Then there was a breakthrough. One of the experts who saw this uh, wheel uh, said that this could be a Catalina. Now I already talked about the Catalina before, when Leonard Bershaw used to detect the Japanese and also what Tommy uh, used to find the, uh, sorry, to, to alert the British Admiralty about the attack in Trinco, right? So what is this uh, consolidated PBY uh, Catalina? It is an American plane and it was one of the iconic planes of World War II, the workhorse, which was used by most of the air forces. It had a huge range. It was a petrol bomber and it could carry a huge amount of ordnance. It was not fast, but it could travel far and it could bomb uh, the hell out of the place it was going. So it was quite a dangerous plane. Uh, right, so you can see the wheel here. So the expert was saying that wheel, sorry. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself, yeah. So this wheel matched the wheel of a Catalina. Okay, so now I was really excited, at least I had a lead. This is an actual Catalina that is still operational in Netherlands. If you go to Netherlands for this particular airport, you can actually do a joyride by paying a reasonable fee. 
I won't do it someday, but let's see. So here are the visual forensics. So after that, I was actually man I managed to confirm that this was indeed a Catalina. I'm not going to get into details, but you can quickly see the similarities, right? So these were the visual forensics. The engine was a Pratt and Whitney uh, twin wasp engine, and uh, similar engines have been found in, in similar underwater aircraft crash sites. Details of the propeller, and this is a bit of in interesting uh, trivia. This plane had a small compartment on top of its fuselage. It was actually called the engineer's window because the flight engineer actually used to sit in this small compartment and look left and right at the engines while they were operational, while it was flying. So up, you know, kilometers up in the air, he was looking at the engine because those days apparently you needed to have visual uh, confirmation of whether the engine is running properly, is there smoke, is there oil running out, so it's quite strange. So I found the engineer's window at the crash site which matched the Catalina as well. Another interesting uh, piece of information, as I said, these uh, planes could travel far and they could bomb uh, using depth charges. They were specifically made for hunting submarines and this metric wave radar gave the capability for the Catalina to see under sea and then release the depth charges, thereby destroying the enemy submarines, right? So you can see the metric wave radar antenna under the wing of the Catalina. Right, so this type of the Catalina and the fact that this was Catalina was now established. Uh, so uh, with more research and more help, I found that there had been three Catalina buses during World War II. I talked to you about two, uh, one about uh, the, the Lennart's plane, which was lost on the first attack of Ceylon on the 4th of April, and Tommy's plane, which was lost on the 9th of April. Right, so those were, but those could be eliminated based on the location, they were, they were not, they didn't crash in Pasaguda, where I found the plane. And also they were not uh, Catalinas with wheels. So they couldn't be the Catalina that I found anyway. You can see the wheel is missing. So these Catalinas could only operate on the surface of water, take off and land on the surface of water. Google Air Force Base, I think you know about this place. In World War II, it was an active place, and you can actually see one of the wheelless Catalinas being pulled back to show after a mission by the crew and uh, people who were helping. So, where is the third Catalina with a wheel and the, with the metric wave radar? Where did it crash? So, again, I got a breakthrough later, but before that, I want to tell you something really interesting. How many of you knew that there was a direct flight from Kogdala to Perth during World War II? This is the reason why that happened. When the Japanese invaded South Asia, the British lost their transit point in Singapore. Generally, they used to fly from Kokkola to Singapore, or wherever from China Bay to, uh, to Singapore, to Perth, to locations in Australia. With the Japanese invasion, they couldn't do it. Now their links were cut off to one of their most important colonies, right? So they needed to establish a link. So what they did was, it was a top secret, uh, military operation, yet it had a civilian front under contest. It was a modified Catalina. Uh, they stripped off all the unnecessary weight, added extra fuel, it could fly for about 7,000 kilometers non stop, 20 to 32 hours non stop. And they used to actually fly in radio silence because they did, they did not dare to use their radio while they were crossing the Singapore Indonesia territory because the Japanese could detect them. And uh, they actually navigated using the stars. So that would have been an extremely uh, skilled feat of navigation. Imagine that, navigating using stars, right? And the 20 to 38 hours uh, over open ocean without, without uh, making landfall. And for this uh, reason, they were called double sunrise flights. Why? Because when the plane took off, uh, it, it actually, uh, started off before dawn and the crew and the passengers could see the sunrise and when it landed also they could see the sunrise because they were in the air for 20 to 30, 30 hours and anyone who managed to successfully make this flight was actually given this nice uh, certificate it was called secret order of double sunrise uh, for having spent more than 24 hours continuously in the air in a regular flight service so this was a military flight service but it was specified as a regular flight service, a front, because they, the Japanese would not attack a, a supposedly a civilian flight service. Right? So really interesting uh, uh, 
uh, to, to find the certificate, right, which was given to passengers. So limited number of passengers really got this. Now, could one of these uh, double sunrise flights be the Mystery Catalina, which I found? Well, no, a couple of reasons. First of all, double sunrise flight did not have wheels, so immediately eliminated. And none of the planes are lost actually in that whole operation, quite remarkably, over the years, they, all of the planes managed to successfully do that uh, run back and forth from uh, Kokkola to Netherlands in Perth and back, right? And they had beautiful names and they were named after the very stars that the flight engineer, the, the navigation specialist used to navigate the, the flight. So these were the names of the, 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 the stars that they, they, they have five, five planes in the, in the service and uh, it's incredible that they managed to pull this off. So the mystery Catalina, which I found, is still unexplained, right? So it's a big mystery. Then I had another breakthrough. A uh, uh, World War II historian, who was also an aircraft specialist, told me about this RAF Dutch Squadron 321, which was established in Sri Lanka during World War II. Now, this is really intriguing. An RAF, uh, RAF, RAF, Royal Air Force Dutch Squadron. What do you mean by a Dutch Squadron? So again, this is a very interesting piece of history, which is related back to the story I told you. The, the, for the same reason, they had to establish the double sunrise flights. When the Japanese uh, invaded South Asia, Java was under Dutch control. So Java is Indonesia, right? And there, there was a, a squadron of Dutch pilots using Catalinas. They escaped the Japanese invasion. They relocated to Colombo. And what the RAF, the RAF did was, they said, okay, we have a Dutch, we used to have a Dutch squadron earlier in, in Europe, where Dutch pilots had actually worked for the RAF. We resurrected this Dutch squadron 321 and put all these pilots in China, right? saying, okay, you guys work here, you run your missions. If you look at this map on the top, you can actually see the old airports of Sri Lanka, Sigiriya, Mineria, Trinko, Nigambo, etc. Do you know that Colombo, the race course was also actually a secret modified uh, uh, airport for a, for a brief, brief period. There are missions run from uh, the, the race force. No one knew about it because they didn't want the Japanese to bomb the race force, but planes were landing and taking off from the race force those days. Right, so here I have some news about the RAF Dutch Squadron 321. So then I came to know about this special mission carried out by this squadron on the 9th of December 1943 at 2.30 a.m. This entailed a special uh, concentrated Catalina called the Y-78. It was located in Sigiri Air Force Base at the time. It had a crew of 11. Their target for this mission was a Japanese submarine prowling around the Andaman Islands. Right? So they had the metric wave data to detect submarines underwater. Also they had depth charges. So they were fully geared. So they took off at 2.30 a.m. Unfortunately when they were taxiing uh, well, I mean, they started to take, uh, take off. Unfortunately, when they were taxiing around the airport, they couldn't, they had to stop because there's a whole bunch of cattle sleeping on the runway. So it took them about half an hour to chase all the cattle, make sure that there was no cattle when the plane took off, and finally managed to be airborne at around 3 p.m. Uh, sorry, 3 a.m. in the morning. So the flight records say there was an incident. They had managed to clear the Elephant Point. Elephant Point is a place in Pasapuda, uh, I don't know why exactly called, it's called Elephant Point. I don't think there, there are elephants there, but it's shaped like the trunk of elephant and there's a rock that looks like elephant. And I think that's why it's called Elephant Point. It cleared Elephant Point at 3.26, was at an altitude of about 450 meters, when the flight engineer noticed that the port side engine was malfunctioning on the left side engine, right? So he was at the engineer's window. Uh, he noticed the engine had stopped oil pressure had gone to zero, now the aircraft was in trouble because this heavily loaded aircraft could not function with one engine. So what happened? The pilot tried to save the aircraft, turned it back. The crew quickly threw away everything. The machine guns, they did, uh, ditched the, the uh, depth chargers, tried to make the flight light so that they would act, at least make it back to, back to shore. But unfortunately, it didn't work and the pilot had to crash land the aircraft in heavy monsoonal seas. Now this was uh, December, seas were relatively rough and, and the rough landing actually sp uh, splintered the aircraft. So there was water coming in. Very fortunately, 
none of the crew members died they were injured but they they survived and what they did is they managed to actually they tried to bail water out of the catalina for hours and hours but didn't work and the catalina sank but they managed to get into a life raft and they rode 16 kilometers to batiklo and made it alive and then the file the file the reports right so that's how this whole story of exactly what happened to this catalina is still uh, in record because they managed to do it and this crash happened 62 miles from sigiria and about 50 miles south of china bay and very interestingly the last known reported location of this mystery catalina was exactly around the place where vasantena had found the mystery plane so at this point i was 99.999% certain that we had found the lost dark squadron 321 y78 however in this uh, in this uh, type of investigations you need a little bit more pre precise proof so what i did was actually contact the dutch embassy and the ambassador louis speed he was very helpful he immediately contacted the, the air force in netherlands and they set up a special panel to investigate this find so one of the uh, so it contained about two former air force commanders of the netherlands air force and this gentleman you see on the left uh, catalina specialist prudent star he still works with uh, old catalinas so the catalina which uh, picture i showed you earlier is the same catalina that he services and maintains he's a he's an engineer right so this group of uh, people they looked at all the photos all the data they talked to me and for three weeks they just went silent so i was also eagerly waiting now okay what's happening is this a plane or not and finally they said yes this is their last dark squadron uh, vice in 78 so it was a remarkable feeling that final the aircraft uh, air crashing investigation had turned up uh, a proper suspect and i tell you this is what nail uh, this was a nail in the coffin in terms of the evidence the uh, flight engineer when the the the, the port side or the left engine had lost oil pressure and stopped working in situations like this what they do is they they do something called feathering feathering is a propeller that is uh, cutting the air right it's it's uh, perpendicular to the air flow they make it parallel to the air flow this gives a degree of aerodynamism to a plane that's engine is not working so the propellers actually act like wings so in his file report he had said that when this accident happened or this incident happened he had feathered the port side propeller and this was exactly reflected in the evidence i found at the crash site you can in, in the left you can see the feathered propeller and and the normal propeller with the propeller turned perpendicular to the wing so this was the final proof and that later that uh, year about 3 months later one of the leading dutch aircraft magazines actually ran this story so it was an amazing uh, conclusion and it, I, i i thought it was like a really crazy ride that i had in, in my shipwreck explorations one of the most amazing experiences and i was just imagining if wasanta had not done anything about that piece of uh, junk or garbage that he had uh, found he had just thrown it back you wouldn't have known this amazing history right so i was i'm very thankful to him that he took the initiative to report it and someone could do something about it imagine how many other stories are lost forever because we don't know what happened right we forgot on the history all right so in uh, conclusion i will talk to you about a little bit on conservation this is a shipwreck that is off the coast of mount lavinia it's actually the uh, picture that i use for my book ghost of the deep so if you see anything like this just buy a few copies um it's it's amazing this shipwreck you can see it's at 45 meters it's, it's a bit of a deep wreck you can see the marine life right that's 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 living here it's full of fish sometimes when i go to the ship it's covered with barracuda i can't see the shipwreck it's it's so amazing and in kalamba this is just 6 meters off the river can you imagine having a shipwreck like this so conservation is really important in terms of shipwrecks for two reasons with well, three reasons obviously dive tourism i talked to you about it fisheries all the fishermen who find these shipwrecks they find it because they actually fish near these shipwrecks because the shipwrecks attract fish and then there are prolific fishing grounds and also the archaeology value imagine the history that we have under 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 water right so these three reasons for a country shipwrecks are absolutely valuable there's no question about it however unfortunately we also have problems with threats to shipwrecks especially in sri lanka dynamite fishing is going on and i must say the navy has done quite a good job when we alert the navy they actually take action and try to uh, to to impede the 
but it's something that constantly come up I and mean, it's like a uh, battle that we constantly fight uh, the sub aqua club uh, has taken a great uh, interest and it puts a lot of effort to come at dynamite fishing uh, also spear fishing i talked to you about the groupers right so the problem with spear fishing is spear fishing if it's done properly could be a sustainable form of fishing but in sri lanka what the divers do is they they use scuba they just go and they just shoot like they are playing a game they just shoot all the big fish so if they had actually found the catalina those groupers wouldn't be there when i when i went and dived it then there's illegal salvage there's plastic pollution uh, other forms of pollution and then ghost netting also is a big problem the the uh, fishing nets they drift when they are lost they drift and they get entangled in the shipwreck just just imagine a uh, net covering this beautiful shipwreck right in front of you right imagine the damage it would do fish die for weeks because the fish just get trapped and they just die for weeks so as part of the software club we also do uh, clean ups where we go and cut the nets and try and rescue the fish and remove the nets from the fish uh, from the ships but we need to do this almost every season because some of the shipwrecks are so badly affected then we have some problems with commercial anchoring where you know big ships come and they just drop anchor uh, onto the shipwreck so there are a lot of threats but i would like to end this by saying we really have some amazing shipwrecks in sri lanka and we as a country we can actually leverage we need to protect it because it's it's it's, it's so good for us in terms of dietary reason archaeology so that comes to the end of my presentation and uh, i can take in questions now over to you graham rashana Yes. i uh, thank you i mean just just amazing absolutely amazing when you told me you were going to talk about a mystery i, I never envisaged this and i was rocked between uh, the deep sea and and the world of aviation i mean it it was so fascinating i'm sure you, you know you just took us into both worlds two absolute you know you know poles <laughs> it it was very fascinating darshan thank you so much um, i'm sure everyone enjoyed it in as much as i did i was just totally intrigued fantastic thank you um um just before i get on to the questions to st another stand out was um for those of you who didn't realize um i just i mean nishan had mentioned this and i've read it before again but darshan made the point that density of shipwrecks in colombo is absolutely amazing so for all those out there who didn't realize um darshan thanks for really pointing that out uh there is so much potential in what we can do in and around these shipwrecks and and the work done by the marine archaeological unit is obviously fascinating but i think we as conservationists should uh, certainly support and and try and support them in their efforts and i'm inviting and pouring my heart out, heart out as it were and inviting all of you uh to really come in and see how we can bring this out uh, and and you know there is there's economic benefits and there is also the more archaeological benefits there's so much we can do and we are this this beautiful gift that we are endowed with so um i'm just calling out and i you've inspired me to do more work on the wnps front on the shipwrecks darshana uh thanks again for that brilliant presentation and being an, and and having an interest in aviation for those of you who had interest in aviation i you know it's probably the first time you've seen you know yourself being rocked between uh, both of these so fantastic thanks again um let me now open oh, thanks darshan um yeah let me now open this out for questions i'm sure there'll be plenty let's try and manage it uh, within the time we have but would anyone like to start just raise your hand you can come in on the chat you can we're having a great audience tonight tonight so hello mr lakshman perera i see you there would you like to is there something Uh, Dashana, can you hear me? Am I being heard? 
Yes, yeah, I can Flavian, hear you. I, okay, Flavian, I, I see a raised hand. Flavian, please go ahead. Graham, you'll have to take the questions from the chat. Okay, I'm seeing it. Sorry about that. From the chat box. Okay. There's, okay, so a general comment again, much awaited, long, long overdue presentation, brilliantly, brilliant documentary, Darshan, you're so skilled and committed. I, I had to read that out to you. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it. So the first question uh, as a, as a warm-up, is the Sri Lanka Navy involved in searching for wrecks? I think you did say it, but if you'd like to elaborate a little more on, on the amount of work they do. Yes, well, it's not the mandate of the Sri Lankan Navy to look for shipwrecks. I think defense is their mandate, right? So that's where the focus should be. However, yes. Sri Lanka Navy does have a role to play in the protection of shipwrecks and making sure that illegal forms of fishing does not happen in our waters. So that way they do, uh, they do uh, you know, help us. And also some, one good thing that they have started doing is to create artificial shipwrecks. Uh, the first artificial shipwreck that in recent times was the VIP car wreck that was sunk off Nigambo with a load of VIP cars and it's now become a popular dive site, right, and, and really vital for the economy of uh, that area. Similarly, they sank uh, a couple of shipwrecks in the East Coast recently. Unfortunately, I had not had the opportunity to dive it. So uh, I think Navy is actively involved in creating opportunities for marine tourism and I'm thankful for them to, uh, for doing that. Fantastic. Okay, um, another interesting question, Darshana. If we expose too many shipwrecks for tourism, uh, what's your view on the sustainability of this whole, whole, all the overcare system? That's a really great question. I am a strong believer of sustainable tourism, and you know we should never get into a situation where we uh, we kill the uh, what do you say, kill the golden goose for the golden absolutely <laughs> golden egg, and. Um, I would think that if now, now right now we don't have a huge amount of pressure on our shipwrecks because we don't have that mass tourism equal to the countries like Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, which has thousands of divers coming in and they make billions of dollars annually because of the dive tourism. However, most of the, uh, the countries like uh, Philippines and, and Malaysia, they have in, implemented very effective community control mechanisms. Yeah, the enforcement is actually done by the community because the money earned from the dive tourism actually goes to the community. So that way the people who make money out of these shipwrecks actually look after them. So it's, it's a great way of doing it and I completely agree, I mean, we should not just open up this, uh, just because we have shipwrecks just open it up so that hundreds and hundreds of people can come in. However, we need to build the industry, right? So it's very important that we don't impose regulations and restrictions to even stop divers who are going in now, who are good intention, genuine divers who care about the environment from going. If you put restrictions and stop them, what's going to happen is all the bad guys are going to have a window to, uh, to salvage the shipwrecks, to do dynamite fishing, to do spear fishing. The only reason that we can actually report these incidents from happening is because we are diving there and we see what's going on. So I think as a country, we should just rush to promote tourism and also to put stringent uh, choking regulations on the dive operators. Interesting. Balance perspective. Absolutely. Absolutely, Dashana. Um, is diving in and around Colombo a security issue? No, it's not. Uh, even during the war, uh, after 2009, we were actively diving around Colombo. I mean, obviously, the security zone uh, was restricted and we couldn't go in. But we were diving all around. I mean, we, uh, it was a lot. Uh, we, we actually checked out from a Navy checkpoint and we didn't have any problems. And right now, there are no problems, there are no restrictions, uh, except quite near the port. It's a port limit, so you can't dive in the port limit. But anywhere else, there are plenty of shipwrecks, plenty of reefs to dive. So that answers the question on diving in Colombo and in and around Colombo. There's, yeah, so the gentleman who asked that, I guess that was clear. Um, when diving is carried out, is there a huge impact on the marine environment per se? Just, just a quick question from someone. Probably yeah. explaining. Good question. Uh, my answer would be ninety-eight percent no, but always there, as, as soon as there's a human being in the sea, there's impact. Okay, and a question related to that: How is diving monitored uh, so as to least disturb marine ecosystems, Darshana? Okay, so it's not monitored. So the thing is, yeah. I talked to you about dive training, right? About a couple of the courses that you would need to do when you are a diver. 
so one of the things that we are inculcated as divers is uh, don't touch don't leave anything back except bubbles don't take anything don't leave anything so yeah. it's actually most of the recreational divers are very uh, i would say self regulating and responsible so so they know the ethics and the etiquette of diving so one of the main things is actually for you to Im- improve your skills so that you don't harm the diving uh, the seabed by trampling the seabed or landing on the seabed so you need to have neutral buoyancy so that you can float up on a wave for a shipwreck and thereby not make contact with it so uh, okay. there are, you know it's very hard to monitor right again as i say we can't establish very strict uh, policies and regulations to monitor because that will stifle the industry rather we need to be self regulating community regulating yeah okay okay um a next question on the shipwrecks i think this would be important from an overall knowledge point of view for the audience on the shipwrecks are there any more ancient shipwrecks other than the ones you mentioned i know the answer is yes but we would like to elaborate for the benefit of the audience yes yeah, so by ancient i presume you are talking about hundreds of uh, years old shipwrecks right um the, the question says ancient but i believe in the context of it is probably shipwrecks by itself in fact how many do we think we have around sri lanka dashan i think it's 300 I plus is it around, looking at the maritime maps and admiralty maps i estimate around 200 to 250 again it's a question of depth Uh, okay the ability to access them is quite hard especially the deep ones when it comes to ancient wrecks uh, if you know just take colombo we have wrecks from 1860s to 2012 and in the okay. east we have wrecks from uh, maybe 1700s to uh, world war 2 okay so yes we do have a fair amount of ancient wrecks however the problem with ancient wrecks is if they are made of wood we will not find any trace of it except for anchors and cannons and cannon balls etc so that's the issue it just disappears wood just drops away fine fine <laughs> interesting one how likely is it that the hf uh, the vampire would be found uh, have there been uns- unsuccessful searches as of yet obviously yes so personally it was a project i was really interested in and i working with lots of fishermen i have been out there Uh, looking for it and diving into blue water to 60 70 meters finding nothing and uh, there was a, a team from australia who came shipwreck detectives in 2006 they did a uh, side scan sonar they could find it and they concluded that it's in the deep trench then the australian navy showed up early 2019 and uh, i gave them several pointers they worked with the maritime archaeology unit and also the navy Uh, they did sonar scanning and they couldn't find anything so i think i would i would strongly believe that it's gone forever it's in the deep water trench beyond diving depth however if you can get a submarine and just look around i'm sure we can find it okay interesting one a little more uh, technical apart from wrecks from a conservation point of view is there any relation between using a steel wreckage as barriers to rejuvenate reefs fashion that's a question that has just popped up get that question if you could repeat it okay apart from i'm just going to read it verbatim apart from the wrecks from a conservation point of view what is your view of using steel wreckages as barriers to rejuvenate the damaged reefs right uh, so so basically i think the person is asking about art- artificial coral reefs probably yeah uh, overall i think it's a good idea however it should be done by professionals who know uh, the lay of the land or lay of the sea so to speak because yeah. corals to regenerate there are so many factors the water clarity the depth uh, the the amount of sunlight so if you just put a shipwreck if it's too shallow then the shipwreck will actually deteriorate because uh, the wave action corals will grow if you put too deep then it's not value for fisheries and uh, for, you know the marine uh, marine tourism so there's like the goldilocks uh, goldilocks zone where the ideal zone depth may be about 25 to 30 meters where shipwrecks can actually thrive and also uh, uh, regenerate coral but i think it's a good idea it's, it's done in other countries but you need to clean up the shipwreck as well you can't just dump the shipwreck because there's so much toxins oil in the ship uh, ship before it sinks okay and based on the on on the subject of steel and and the water inside the water the fact I'd like to comment on the buses that are used and put back into the sea to uh, to generate marine ecosystems uh, is that what your views on that tashan uh, i haven't really studied it i think 
that fear is that maybe buzzers might not be having a longer life underwater because they are quite flimsy and made of uh, made of uh, you know aluminium and all that. So I think it will collapse. So I am not expert in that area specifically because I think any structure that needs to be put has to be uh, has has to have long life and be able to weather the, the conditions of the ocean, especially the salt. There's so much ero uh, erosion and also. Um, uh, you know the salt effects of salt that can damage the, the metal. So it, it, if, if it's not long lasting, then it, it's a waste of effort, right? It just crumbles, crumbles away. Right. Uh, probably something not quite related, says the the person asking the question. But is there any coral gardening projects ongoing in Sri Lankan coastal waters? Is there, if you think is there any pot potential for coral gardening? Uh, yes, so again, this is not my area of expertise. I think yeah. uh, Nishan would be a good person. I know, it's not quite, but absolutely. There are projects going on, and again, I, what I find is there are a lot of people who think that corals are a plant, and they think that you can just plant coral anywhere, right? So again, this has to be approached by scientists, marine biologists in, in a proper way, and if the proper procedures are followed, yes, we can have successful coral regeneration. Yeah. Question two. Yeah, two, I'm just going to merge two questions. Um, the potential negative impact of some of the development projects that are going on or in and around Colombo, that's one. Uh, the other would be the effect, impact of anchoring of ships, which is obviously a, a question that would probably come up long ago. But, you know, in effect, the same thing of two, two different activities. What are your views on that, Tashana? How much impact do you think? Some of the development activity that's happening around, like the port city, for example, with that. Yeah, so as far as shipwrecks are concerned, there is uh, not much impact. There is actually shipwreck about 500 meters from the, the uh, port city breakwater, which I have dived with the maritime archaeological unit. We investigated that in 2014. I call that yeah. story. Um, so hopefully, I mean, that would be the only shipwreck that would be in, in any way reasonably affected, but it's still out of the, the port boundary. However, any human development, I think, requires a proper uh, environmental analysis, and uh, the, uh, there can be pollution effects, right? So I'm sure there is there is uh, there is impact, and it's always spread off between the environment impact and the economic benefit uh, to the country. But I also don't believe that we should sacrifice the environment for the economic benefit. So it's, it's a bit of a controversial and hard question. Uh, coming to shipwreck anchoring. Yes, shipwreck anchoring can cause uh, serious damage. I'll give you one example. There was this beautiful shipwreck at 10 kilometers off the coast of Colombo, specifically Ball Face. It's called the Tapra Bay Spray. And it had this beautiful coral growth around it uh, up till 2014, I believe, and or 15. And then I, when I dived in 2016, I was like really devastated because part of the ship had just completely obliterated. And then I got to know that it was because of uh, ship anchoring. And, 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 and actually, one of the sites that I have highlighted, uh, even to the MEPA, is there's a very pristine uh, coral reef north of Columbia called the Taproobian North Reef. Unfortunately, it's also the outer anchorage, but uh, managed to alert the port authorities and they did promise to not let the ships anchor there. Uh, the anchors had done massive damage. So there were, it was like highways on the reef. There's a highway, literally a highway. Corals have been shaved by this massive anchor being dragged along the coral reef. So I'm sure we lost about 6-7% of the reef uh, that way. Fantastic. There are questions flooding in. I'm just wondering how to cope. So, I'm, I mean, it's great. Fantastic to see. Okay. Uh, interestingly, a bit cultural here. Any Dutch, Portuguese or French wrecks? Also, anecdotally, are there any Chinese wrecks? But uh, what do you... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are. But yeah, please elaborate, Tashanet. Yes, uh, I never personally encountered Dutch wrecks. I think there's one of Kalpit here. Um, someone has told me about it, but I haven't been able to find it. I don't know where it is. Uh, yeah. Dutch wrecks, I can't, nothing pops into my mind. Um, French wrecks, again, no. However, there was a battle in, uh, in uh, the French were in the uh, Trichomoly Fort during the Re American Revolutionary Wars, and they had a huge fight between the British and the uh, French, uh, but none of the ships were sunk. As far as I know, so there is no French ships, and anyway, they would be good, so it would be hard to find at this point. Uh, absolutely. In terms of species, Dashan, I know you get amazing species, and uh, but is there anything that you can a standout species that either has been discovered in a shipwreck? Would you like to comment on that in and around the shipwreck? Um, 
I can't say that there is anything specific in a shipwreck that is not in a relief. What I what I find in Sri Lanka is that the shipwrecks, especially the deeper shipwrecks below 30 meters, are much more prolific and healthier than a, a, the reefs we have in Sri Lanka. So that's why I think Sri Lanka's greatest strength is actually shipwreck diving or shipwrecks as a, as a marketable tourism uh, revenue generation asset. Okay. Uh, have I pronounced correctly? Uh, diving stories on the Thermopylae Sierra, right? Off Lunava. Is the wreck visible over water still? It's a question. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. And the other one, a shipwreck on the Godavai ancient shipwreck. Any comments on that? Yes. So I think this is again a very unique shipwreck for Sri Lanka, like the Hermes. And um, Maritime Archaeology Unit and the Department of Archaeology, they are still unearthing uh, you know, a lot of information about it. So um, I think they are trying to find out where it came from and what sort of pot shards and materials are there. So they, I'm sure it will take some more time, but it's, it's a very unique and a very special wreck for Sri Lanka for sure. Fantastic. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a couple. I'm just trying to group some of these questions, Ashina. So just give me, give me a tick on, you know. Yeah, and also we're just running into time. So I'm just trying to figure out how how we can um, yeah apart from tourism um, can diving provide obviously yeah that's again on the economy it's, it's fairly straightforward but interesting if you can elaborate because I'm sure that's something we need in conservation look at how we can balance both economic ecological and obviously conservation aspects so apart from tourism can diving provide a source of income for people yes absolutely what is the potential for yeah. I'll give you an example in, in Indonesia Bali uh, there's a village called Tulamben, and there they have a wreck called the Liberty Wreck that's 30 meters deep. This whole village is surviving because of that wreck. So there are restaurants, there are hotels, there's transportation, there are helpers from the village helping to carry the dive gear to this uh, shipwreck. The entire village is basically living off one shipwreck. So you can imagine the power of absolutely a shipwreck that yeah. we have and come to see. So in community living off some of these ecosystems is something that's least picked about and taken into consideration. I think that's an important aspect uh, in the whole conservation ecosystem, I guess. Yeah. Um, how popular is diving as a sport in Sri Lanka? And uh, can it, how, is it, how can it be actively promoted, uh, Darshana? Any comments on that? You, obviously, there's tremendous potential, but any, any comments on how that can be further um, magnified or further Booster. Yes, so I think I have seen a very interesting trend. Up till about five years ago, it was only foreign, mostly foreign divers who were active in Sri Lanka. Right, so they come to Sri Lanka for their vacation. They are not uh, primarily coming here for vacation, and they just dive as part of just being in Sri Lanka and then uh, knowing to dive. Now I see foreign divers specifically coming to Sri Lanka to dive certain shipwrecks. So that's also good development. Then I have. Seen last five years, lots of Sri Lankans actually getting into the sport and, and also very young, uh, very young people. Maybe uh, from, actually my nephew 10 years old started his uh, scuba diving yeah. life. And then I know a lot of kids in the range of 13 to 14 to 15 teenagers. I've seen hundreds of divers now on social media. And I think one of the uh, reasons for diving to be now popular among Sri Lankans is actually social media. Absolutely. And, uh, and, and, and also, I think most of the divers, like myself and then, uh, you know, others, the sub Club, we have promoted diving. We have actually, the sub Club has also expanded the membership. So I think it's now, it's now becoming really popular. It's almost like the thing to do now. Absolutely. Because, you know, we are talking of six to eight times more of ocean, ocean land mass. Uh, ocean area than land land area in Sri Lanka. You're talking 550,000 to 600,000 square kilometers of area versus 65,000 square kilometers of land. So there's so much, so much to do out there, I guess. So interestingly, two more questions that follow up and that's something that just popped up. Is it very expensive to get into diving as a sport for anyone interested? I'm sure there'll be people encouraged. Two, do you think there'll be, uh, it should be encouraged even at school level and not really confined to swimmers per se, but I'm sure if it's really if the knowledge is out there, uh, do you think it can be encouraged at school level as well, Darshan? Uh, yeah, so the first question I think was about the cost. Yes, diving can be expensive cost because of the fact that you need a boat, you need uh, additional crew, you need uh, special equipment. The licensing can be expensive. 
so yes, it's it's relatively compared to any other sport. It's yes, it's expensive sport, uh, but you know there are now so many dive centers in Sri Lanka, and actually the cost per dive is quite reasonable in some places. So it's it's quite affordable. Uh, when it comes to school level promotion, yes, it can be promoted in school level. And actually, if you take the Saint Thomas's uh, Subaco Club, it uh, actually yeah. actively promotes scuba diving among uh, among you know uh, students. And, and and as a result, we are seeing very competent divers coming up from schools. Yeah. Absolutely, it doesn't come up as top of mind for as a sport by itself, but I'm sure there is so much potential out there. Absolutely. So there's a flood coming in, and there's a there's a, there's a hand of a clock that's now appearing, threatening me, hanging over my head as it were. So I'm going to quickly run through some questions which I'm going to pick for those of you who haven't, I haven't picked up, I'm sorry, but we can always take it offline. I'm sure Dashana would be, would be happy to help. Dashana, quick check, and I think important, dynamic fishing and other forms of harmful fishing obviously are very much uh, could, you know, it just working in the opp opposite direction. Is there anything that you'd like to comment on that? Yes, extremely destructive and uh, I've seen examples of ships like the British Sergeant, for example, complete with the yeah. coral, top player destroyed, the fish killed and uh, it actually, uh, now this is very dangerous for Sri Lanka because it can kill the diving tourism. If the word goes down in the internet saying that Sri Lanka is allowing uh, spear fishing in their rigs, Sri Lanka is allowing dynamite fishing, it can just kill the potential revenue potential for the country. So it's very, very dangerous to allow these practices to go on. Absolutely. You're just killing that goose with the golden egg as it were. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, something we really need to talk hard about. Um, are fisher communities in the east near shipwrecks aware of the wrecks? And are they interested in community management? Interestingly, you know, it's fascinating for us, but how, what is the impact and what is the interest level of village communities in and around shipwrecks, Dashana? Yes. More impact. Since the time is so constrained, I'll answer it very quickly. The, the communities who are, so to speak, right in front of the shipwreck and we are the fish day to day, they are very interested in the health of the shipwreck and they don't like dynamite fishermen coming in, for example, destroying or spear fishermen coming in, destroying the ecosystem. So the problem with the dynamite fishermen is actually they can come from different villages. So they sneak in and they destroy the shipwrecks that are far away from them and then they sneak back. So, uh, but as far as the community is concerned, the, 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 the respectable, normal fishermen, they are really interested in preserving the source of their income. And they don't encourage language fishing, they don't encourage uh, fish. Absolutely, absolutely. So, answer to the question on what is Darshana's book, it's called Ghosts of the Deep. Uh, please do get into that as fast as possible. I'm sure you'll find it very fascinating. How about shipwrecks off the bases, lighthouses, in, or yeah, the lighthouse bases in Southeast Sri Lanka, Darshana? Can you um, comment on that? I have a question. Uh, off the bases um, oh, right, in right. Southeast Sri Lanka, yeah. I think you mean buses, the great buses and the little buses, reef. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry, yes. it's buses. Yeah, so, so uh, it's the, the conditions of the shipwrecks are not good because it's a very shallow place and also it's a very violent place, right? These huge waves roll in and come and crash into the Basas Reef and there's a lot of sunlight. So the, all the shipwrecks, which are ancient shipwrecks like the silver wreck, which Arthur Seaglark found, the, there's a copper wreck, there's a couple of more shipwrecks scattered there. They are basically anchors, uh, engines, propellers. So it's not ship shape, but there's something, something there. But it's, it's a, Basas is a great place to dive. It's again a tourism asset. So totally, totally underutilized, I guess. Yeah, so much more work to do on it. So I'm going to, yeah, though not quite related to marine, Darshan, I, I can't not ask this question. I think it's, I see it coming up uh, on this forum. I'm going to leave, I'm going to, you know, have to have to leave that as to say the best for last. As it was. Anything that you'd like to say, there's so many questions popping up on your cave dive in Helder. Um, how would you, anything that you'd like to say um, on that one for the audience here? Yeah, it it's very hard to uh, say a little about it. There's uh, Absolutely. about it. Maybe I can do another session about this. But I think it's, a, it's, again, I think it's an incredible place. I have done so many cave dives in, um, in other countries. And I must say this whole location, the, uh, the, the way you need to access the cave, 
it's, it's an amazing place and i think it's a national pressure uh, so right now i have i can for reasonable certainty say that i have mapped the entire underground, underground section of the cave and that it's uh, it's a natural creation and i know there are so many myths and theories about its uh, creation but as far as i'm concerned it's it's just nature uh, having created this very beautiful amazing over uh, the cave inside the mountain and also part of it extends underwater for about half a kilometer and what's become of it now darshan i have are they really is there any i don't see any of the material i may be wrong but you know has it is it providing to be as thrilling as something like the zip line or something you know what i'm saying it is so fascinating but is it out there for for tourism or is it out there for people to go and explore is there stuff to know a number of uh, excursion being done as uh, hikers so hikers can actually you know rappel down and, and it's, it's a bit of a hard trek to go down there so it's, it takes a lot of physical uh, uh, i would say uh, you need to be physically fit and also not claustrophobic right because you are you are kind of squeezing through small spaces bat guana spiders bats and all that all 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 sorts of fun and then the diving actually becomes a cave dive so so the thing is that uh, i mean there are i would say almost no cave divers in sri lanka because cave diving is a it's completely different training it's a different uh, different type of it's a high risk uh, endeavor uh, so so far it's only myself and another foreign diver who uh, who i have been cave diving in other countries who have actually come and dived but uh, so the cave diving potential is there as a tourism potential but again it has to be a resource that has to be very carefully managed because it's a very uh, Uh, fragile ecosystem there are actually creatures living there and and the cave should not be harmed there should be plastic pollution so but it's yes there's a tourism potential for it absolutely so i can't leave without asking you this question dasana was cave diving a part of your agenda as it were is it something that you just took to and you just wanted to uh, later on in your 18 years span of diving yeah so i i think the, the uh, what i tell anyone who wants to dive is take take it slowly don't rush enjoy the ride don't I have uh, targets and trying to do I need to do this certification that's not what I did I just went along uh, trying to try and see where it went so the reason actually I started cave diving is uh, I wanted to explore shipwrecks and going into a shipwreck can be very dangerous so uh, I I had a very bad experience and after that experience I thought okay, I'm not going to do it again until I have the proper skills and uh, equipment and the training and i started cave diving because cave diving actually gives you the same sort of skills and the equipment and, and the training you need to penetrate a shipwreck and that made me hooked on caves so then cave caves become another became another passion out of shipwrecks fantastic many questions coming into my mind uh, but rather unfortunately uh, the clock has ticked darshana it is absolutely enthralling um, really really thank you so much and again for me thank you for taking me into aviation and down into into marine it was, it was just fantastic uh, so on behalf of all of us out there i mean i see thank you very much again i'm um, sorry i haven't been able to take in all the questions but i've grouped in as many as i can so that i can you know club most of them together so that uh, if there's anything i'm sure darshana will be anything that we've left out we'll be happy to answer uh, and in behalf of all of us at the wnps thanks for a great evening darshana and the very best to you in in the rest of your uh explorations and your adventures i could call it absolute ad- adventures thanks again good night and good night everyone okay thanks thanks